create a, a lot of wildlife feed if you feed the thing. Feed every time you every time you disturb the soil. If you start putting out seeds, you really increase your wildlife habitat. Is the intent to provide drinking water? Is that what you're doing? Or no, no. You don't even want to hold water. You just want to hold it up for a while and let it soak in the ground or go around it or go under it and just create some more wet ground behind it for, for all your grasses. And, and as, as you're building one of these, so we're going to see you do it in a minute, but about how much time, dozer time, does it take you? What kind of cost would you put on, on one of these? That you're probably, doing? with a dozer like this one, it's probably $100, $100, $100, $150. Okay. Yeah, what's What's peculiar to you about uh, this particular location? Why why do we choose this spot to build a spreader dam? Well, we've got a long sloping flat to our northwest coming down, probably dropping, what do you say, two foot every 50 yards or 100 yards. Or more. And then right here we start with a, it's starting to form a wash, it's eroding right here. So I can put a spreader dam right across here and stop the erosion, plus holding the water up. Okay, and once you build that spreader dam right here, is that it for this draw, or what will you do next? No, you, you can just keep on going down the draw about every 200 yards and build another one, ever, ever so many feet of drop, whatever you, whatever you think where one needs to be. Probably from here to the bottom of the hill, we'll probably build five or six more. Don, we, we kind of talked about why we build a spreader dams and what kind of location, but from a dozer operator standpoint, give me exactly what your method was in doing this. Well, the first thing I did was scrape off the ground right where the little berm is built. You don't want to core it like you do a tank dam so the water can pass in under the dam to create some moisture behind the dam. And I've dug this thing out probably where it'll hold maybe two foot of water if it before or three foot before it runs around and then it'll a lot of it'll starve in the ground and go in behind the dam and and when you put your grass seed in all this thing will be covered with with your grass. And about uh, what, what size of a dozer do you have and, and what kind of machine does it take in order to be effective at doing that? Well this is a this is a 850 case and with a six way blade on it and got rippers on the back for when the dirt's hard and it's about a hundred horse hundred horse dozer and you can get by with one smaller and you can use a larger when it doesn't really it just takes a little longer or quicker. I noticed you did build a little spillway over mm -hmm. one end of it uh, just to keep it more snap when you do get there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you just I I just kind of eyeball the thing, and sometimes I miss my my laser's not very good in one eye. <laughs> okay, so when you're feeding, is it best like right now to get off and, and hand broadcast the feed out while it's fresh? I usually try to uh, let it settle. It needs a rain on it, and probably March is the best time to feed the thing. Okay, so you don't really need to have the fresh soil in the feeding the top. No, and you notice I left the the bottom of it rough. Mm -hmm. I could, you can flick it up and and make it real slick, but the grass seed comes up better when it's rough. Okay. Anything else, uh, you know, in the in the blueprint of how you did this? Well, uh, a lot of people, you can just push the dirt up, but I, I run across the dam three or four times to kind of pack the dirt down a little bit. If you, if you just run the dirt up and leave it, leave it at a peak, uh, a lot of times cattle building trails across it will knock it, knock it down, and they can walk across this thing and they'll use it for a, use it for a bridge or what have you. And, and if you keep packing that dirt down, the dam will last a lot longer. Some people call these gully plugs or check dams, and on the roads we call them spreader dams, or like you call them speed bumps, or stop, <laughs> what do you call them? Uh, I call these spreader dams. Spreader dams. Call, uh, the main main reason is just to slow your water up, don't let it get away from you in such a hurry. And if you put, put one dam behind the other one, you just keep running one around into the other one, and you have a continuous, continuous stream of water when it does rain. And, Don, 
you don't find many stands of yellow Indian grass like this in uh, Fisher County, although I guess historically there was a good bit of it. Uh, uh, tell us what you did here and, and what, you know, how long has this been planted and kind of what your response has been. Well, this is, uh, I built a roadblock there to keep the water from washing down the road and planted this in Indian grass and this is what you get in three years. And then of course you got a lot of ragweed response right here also, so you've got a, a good situation whether you're interested in the grazing or interested in the quail either one. You got both situations. Both situations. Right there. There's a little bit of big blue stem in here. It's about the same height as this Indian grass. Okay, Don, we're in one now that you didn't see the grass, just natural vegetation and uh, it grew up in some real good food for quail. What are some of them? Well, we've got the croton weed in here, and we've got the ragweed, and we've got an abundant supply of sunflowers this year. Now, we're talking about a year this year that's the wettest year we've seen in 20 years. What do these sites look like in a dry year? Do they look better or look worse? Well, we still have the ragweed. We don't have the sunflowers like they are. The sunflowers are ticked all over the ranks this year. But overall, as we compare this site to the adjacent site, it's even more dramatic in a dry year, isn't it, than oh, it is a wet year? True, true. I guess the recipe is just add water. Add water. 